special collection section of the TCOM library conducting an oral history interview with Dr. Mary Lou Shunter, the chairman of the anatomy department of TCOM and one of his first faculty members. Dr. Mary Lou, you've been here since uh, before we opened the doors back in 1970. Uh, there must be a number of reasons why you chose this particular part of the profession of the healing arts. Uh, I know you've had some background in medical science. Uh, what was uh, your first, your introduction to osteopathic medicine, or who was it with, and how did it come about? Well, my first uh, introduction to osteopathic medicine actually came after I uh, became employed with TCOM. I had been teaching at Texas Christian University here in Fort Worth, had finished my master's degree, and was working there. I was working with pre-professional students in a laboratory situation, as well as teaching nursing students in the anatomy and physiology course. An article appeared in the Fort Worth Star-Telegram during the summer of 1970, uh, detailing the opening of the new medical school and describing uh, its founding, etc. And uh, I read the article with interest. I had been a medical student many years previous to that, had elected not to pursue becoming a physician at that time, and uh, decided that I would like to combine my interest in teaching with a more medically oriented environment. I made an appointment with Dr. Hart, the first dean of the college, and came out and talked with him about a position teaching anatomy, which was my first love. And uh, we proceeded to uh, discuss the possibilities, and I did indeed uh, acquire a position as a faculty member. At that time, uh, they had a person online who was to be chairman of the anatomy department, so I viewed myself as a faculty member in the anatomy department. Uh, about the end of August or the first part of September, right prior to the opening of classes, this individual uh, ran into some difficulties and was unable to come. So I suddenly found myself as the anatomy department at that point, mm -hmm. which was uh, an interesting experience. Yes, I, <laughs> I remember a little of that from the outside looking in. Uh, I taught at TCU through the end of August and then immediately came on board full time with TCOM was at the 1st of September. Uh, some previous groundwork had already been laid by Dr. Hart and Dr. Harris in terms of initiating a ruling from the Attorney General's office with reference to the fact that TCOM uh, was indeed a bona fide medical school and therefore was entitled to the privileges and responsibilities that any medical school in the state of Texas would incur. Uh, I was appointed as a representative to the State Anatomical Board, which then made it possible for us to acquire cadaver material for our laboratory situation. Uh, that first year, we had a lot of dedicated clinical people who gave it generously of their time and effort in the teaching program, often or in most cases without any financial reward. Um, Teaching anatomy encompasses a number of different courses, so obviously it was impossible for one individual to cover all of these areas. I myself taught the gross anatomy course uh, in its entirety that year. We had two pathologists from Fort Worth Osteopathic Hospital who taught the histology course, and I ended up sort of by default teaching the neuroanatomy course after we had finished the gross anatomy course, which was a very full year. <laughs> Dr. Um, Kimplin, Dr. Alter, Dr. Jenkins all contributed generously of their time in enabling us to teach uh, the anatomy courses, particularly gross anatomy. Dr. Harris taught the embryology course that year.
response to your initial question, Ray, my orientation or my introduction to osteopathic medicine per se uh, grew through my association with the college, with the students, and with the physicians who participated in the early development of the school. Mm -hmm. I uh, feel that those early students were very special people. The first two classes were very dedicated students who put up, if you want to use that phrase, with the inconveniences that we had all had to live with. Could I interject a question there when you refer to inconveniences? Can you uh, can you list a few things that uh, when you say they had to put up, is there anything? This particular, of course, naturally we were beginning, and uh, 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 certainly our reach did ex extend our grasp many, many times. Mm -hmm. But uh, can you think of anything that you can uh, enumerate? Uh, well, probably the, one of the hardest things to deal with was the physical setup of the institution, in that uh, the classroom itself, uh, while very generously finished and built for us, was less than ideal. Mm -hmm. referred to it as a steamship, as I remember, because there were a couple of abutments that jutted into the classroom. <laughs> I was involved to some degree in that because, you recall, I was the contractor mm -hmm. to take and renovate that unfinished floor, of the fifth floor of the hospital, uh, and I hired just a carpenter to do it. And I know, uh, I know a little bit of uh, uh, rebuke, uh, I guess is a good word, that I got from Dr. Lubel about the way I let the carpenter dress that. <laughs> Uh, well, up to make it look like a ship, I guess. Yeah, well, actually, it it looked very nice, uh, and the the shape and so forth were dictated by the pipes that were Right, right, there. and that's what we were trying to do was to cover right. the pipes the best mm -hmm. we could. Excuse me, go uh, ahead. That's right. We had a, a platform, since the floor was flat, we had a platform at the front of the room so that the faculty could be seen, those of us, Dr. Harris and myself, who were too short to be seen otherwise. Uh, it was an interesting situation in that the platform ended just short of the windows. And sometimes in the heat of a lecture, I think it happened to everyone at least once, you found that you fell off the end of the platform <laughs> and caught yourself on the window ledge as you went down. Mm -hmm. Just minor inconvenience. Right. right. Uh, the blackboards had been hung by someone who was six foot three, so I could use only the lower third of the blackboard in my lectures. <laughs> Those, you know, those were more funny than right, than anything. Right. Uh, my first laboratory was uh, in a makeshift situation. Actually, it worked very well. It was a renovated apartment and uh, worked very nicely for the 20 students we had. We were able to set up our own ventilation system. Uh, we had a nice set of audio-visual materials that were generously purchased, which certainly helped us in the laboratory situation. The next year we moved to, an, to larger quarters, which again, for makeshift quarters, were certainly more than adequate. The students uh, assisted in the move, they assisted in construction. Those students really um, were 24-hour-a-day students. When they weren't being students, they were helping build the college, literally. And I have very special feelings for those students. Uh, they worked hard. They worked with the faculty. The faculty worked with them. I'm very proud of every one of them. I have students who still come back to visit with me, and they have all achieved a, a very good degree of success. And I find that fulfilling for me as a faculty member mm -hmm. to know that those people have succeeded. One more of the uh, inconveniences that we encountered, uh, you will remember this, you and I and another faculty member shared an office for the first year and a half or so. Right. And one had to develop the ability to sit at one's desk and completely close out all the other activity in order to function. Well put. <laughs> um, we had, as faculty, we typed our own examinations. We ran them off on a on the mimeograph machine ourselves. Uh, we all had to be uh, very versatile in terms of functioning as faculty members. I'd like to mention some 
a couple of things about Dr. Hart the first dean of the school. Dr. Hart is a very special person. I consider him one of the Certainly last. Is. I consider him one of the last true gentlemen of the world. He had been my freshman chemistry professor many years ago at Texas Christian University, and I found it uh, extremely rewarding to come back and work with him in this setting. His experience in working on the Board of Examiners had given him insight into the functioning of the medical schools in the state of Texas. And his approach to faculty, treating them always as the professional in their own area, as the expert, one of my fondest memories and something I will always treasure. Being of German extraction, he preferred to faculty as professor with his very German accent. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was probably, um, gave me a sense of professionalism that I encounter in mm -hmm. very few other situations. To hear him say that is still a nice memory. Um, the growth of the school has changed a lot of the atmosphere of the school and progress, of course, is what we want and where we're going. But the, the opportunity to work with students in classes of 20 and 30, as we had at the beginning, is a very rare opportunity. It's almost like one-on-one -on -one teaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, one loses that, obviously, as you go to larger classes. I think that it's good for the students in a way in that you're able to identify student problems at a very early point and have the opportunity and the time to work with them. This is something you lose as you acquire larger classes, obviously. Dr. Mary Lou, I certainly had a great respect and uh, admiration for what you've been able to accomplish as a professor and as a faculty member and, and then rising to the head of the Department uh, of Anatomy since you've been with TCOM. But of course you only had a master's degree when you first came here uh, and uh, you took a sabbatical, I, maybe that's not the proper term, but at least you left for a while with the, the approval of the administration to work on your doctorate. Uh, could you uh, express uh, some personal reflections about some of the experience that led up to your achieving uh, your doctorate uh, and where you got it and under what circumstances? Yes, I would like to comment on that. I might say in leading into it that I feel a lot of my life has been a series of being in the right place at the right time incident. I had been teaching here at the college for two years and we got a notice of a grant proposal into the institution. Dr. Hart called me into his office and said that I was the only one in the institution who was eligible for this, but that he felt that I was uniquely qualified to apply for it. It was offered through the Department of ACW, uh, the Bureau of Health Professions, and it was a grant proposal for a person who was either already a faculty member or would be guaranteed a position as a faculty mem member in a medical institution to pursue a higher degree. We filled out the necessary forms and I applied to work on my PhD in anatomy. Uh, this was done through the Baylor University, the Dallas campus at the medical center, specifically through the dental school, which offered the anatomy program. We sent the forms in, I believe it was in April of that year, and more or less dismissed them from our minds at the time. Uh, I believe it was the 7th of July, we got a telegram from our representatives saying that I had indeed been awarded one of these uh, programs. And uh, this created a flurry of activity because I think we had not anticipated such a speedy response. So this necessitated a search for someone to fill my position while I would be gone. 
this was accomplished in the end of August of 72. I went on a, I believe it was classified as a leave of absence for educational purposes. And I was gone for three years while I worked on my PhD in anatomy. This occurred just at the time that the school uh, affiliated with North Texas State mm -hmm. University and the basic science years were moved to the Denton campus. So during the initial years on the Denton campus, I was not here at the institution. <clears throat> I came back in the fall of 1975 and resumed full-time duties with the institution. I was in the process of writing my dissertation at the time, and my degree was then granted in the spring of 76 after I had finished my dissertation and my defense my Then when you returned uh, to TCOM in the teaching capacity, uh, we actually, the school actually was a state institution at that time, yes, part I, of the North Texas system. Right, I came back at the time that we became a fully affiliated or a fully subsidized yeah, state institution. About 1st of September. Oh, I guess we probably became a state affiliated with uh, North Texas back about the 16th of May, I guess, when the governor signed the bill, but we didn't consider uh, that we were part of the state uh, system, I guess, until September 1 of that year. Right. In the meantime, the department had grown uh, to include three full-time faculty members. And three full-time. And mm -hmm. the class had increased. I believe there were 57 in that class the year I came back. So I came back to a much different situation than I had left and have found uh, the challenge of working with a larger department and moving the institution back to the Fort Worth campus, the increased number of students. It's all been a very exciting and very challenging time. Dr. Mary Lou, this has been a very fine discussion that you've given to us on some of your thoughts about uh, your association with uh, the Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine and one of its first uh, faculty members. And I know that you have seen it progress a long way in the 10 short years that we have been open. As you think back on your experiences and your relationships with uh, the school and uh, every person in general, uh, if you had it to do over again, what, uh, uh, what are your reflections about that? Are there certain positive and certain negative thoughts that you have, or, or just what, uh, what would you try to do, or what are your general comments and about uh, that particular subject? One of the first comments I would make is uh, quoting Dr. Hart, the first dean, who was uh, given to commenting that the opportunity to build a medical school was a rare opportunity that few people had to participate in. And I think I agree wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly with that. Being able to participate, particularly in those first few years of the development of the institution, I look back on as being some of the most challenging, rewarding, and happiest years of my professional career. If I had it to do it over again, absolutely. I would do it again with all of the um, attendant problems and uh, Humor. There was a lot of humor in those mm -hmm. initial years. <laughs> we all had a right. good time. We worked very hard, but we all had a sense of building, and that in itself carries you through almost beyond the point where you know you can achieve. It carries you on even to areas you're not sure you can achieve. Doesn't it compensate a little bit for the ignorance of certain things or oh. the lack of uh, uh, intelligence about how to do certain things? It kind of compensates for that. Oh, right? I think absolutely. Undoubtedly, we all had broad areas of ignorance in terms of building the school. Right. But I think our enthusiasm and our willingness to work together helped overcome mm -hmm. some of those problems. And absolutely, I would do it again. Thank you. This is Ray Stokes in the oral section, oral history section of the TCOM Library. 
I've been conducting a oral interview with uh, Dr. Mary Lou Schunder, the anatomy chairman of the, the Department of Anatomy here at TCOM. And we're grateful, I'd like to put it on record, for Dr. Mary Lou Schunder's willingness to share with us some of her memoirs of the first decade of this great osteopathic medical school. These interviews cover two recording sessions, November the 18th and December the 10th, 1980. 